It's a great pleasure for me to welcome the next speaker for today, Dr. Jeff Wagner. Dr. Wagner is research scientist at California Department of Public Health Environmental Health Laboratory. Dr. Wagner completed his PhD in environmental science and engineering from University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. His current work focuses on accessing potential exposures to environmental toxics using the novel measurements and modeling techniques. Welcome Dr. Wagner and the floor is all yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to be speaking today about micro FTIR and scanning electron microscope analyses of microplastics uh, in various environmental sample matrices. Uh, our work at the Environmental Health Lab uh, uses novel measurement analysis and modeling techniques uh, to assess environmental exposures for various projects and investigations. So often these projects will involve microspectroscopy and microimaging. Uh, our most common matrices are probably air samples, but we also do a lot of consumer products, uh, water samples, soil, sediment, and biota. And depending on the project needs and the matrix, uh, we will typically do a custom sample prep method. Um, I won't be speaking about these today, but they also often involve interpretive models, um, active or passive sample collection, and sensors. In general, uh, our work focuses on particle characterization, uh, specifically chemical composition, particle size, morphology, and surface properties, as well as the distribution of co-present species and mixtures within these particles. On the lower right, uh, you see an example. This is a SEM uh, spectral uh, imaging map that shows the distribution in particular of bromine hotspots within a microplastic particle. Um, and these types of particle characterizations then become a useful fingerprint uh, for uh, identifying potential sources. So I wanted to um, clarify that what I'll be talking about today are targeted microanalyses um, as opposed to routine monitoring techniques. And in that regard, they tend to be uh, bit more time consuming than routine lab methods such as GCMS with auto samplers. Um, however, um, for the right type investigation, they are a powerful method for, um, for focusing in on either um, identification of unknown exposures or potential sources. And they're really useful for invest investigations at specific problem sites or perhaps uh, specific high concentration samples obtained from routine monitoring, um, or perhaps a specific uh, time period of concern or health relevant questions. Um, some examples of these types of targeted uh, public health investigations that uh, we conducted with partner agencies and stakeholders um, that I'll be speaking about in just a moment are, um, for example, troubleshooting uh, flame retardant uh, monitoring samples. Um, in that case, they were house dust and uh, consumer products. Another example that I'll be discussing in more detail is IDing potentially hazardous components inside uh, specific patients' vaping devices. And finally, uh, I'll be speaking about uh, some of our work uh, involving an improved understanding of sources, fates, and measurement artifacts for microplastic debris in water and fish stomachs. Uh, I'll be focusing on SEM and FTIR today. Um, those are two um, useful and complementary techniques, the former focusing, or rather um, strongest for inorganic components um, and FTR strongest for organic components, though there is a lot of overlap. They have slightly different size ranges. Um, and in general, we will often combine these with several other techniques um, that I won't be discussing as much today, uh, such as optical microscopy, Raman microspectroscopy, transmission electron microscopy. And then, though it doesn't exactly belong with the microspectroscopy techniques, um, bulk X-ray fluorescence is also useful. 
And uh, these also all vary in the information they can give you as far as uh, reflected techniques versus transmission techniques. Uh, we also often combine these with a variety of other forensics tools, such as um, obtaining bulk samples of suspected source materials, um, using uh, particle and chemical library databases, increasingly using publicly available data, um, such as GIS, uh, MET monitoring data, as well as, in some cases, uh, manufacturer specs for various products. Um, and then in some cases, we will do lab studies to try and simulate uh, the exposure. On a, one example uh, on the right is a project we did um, looking at laser printer nanoparticle generation mechanisms, simulating that in the lab, um, and it turned out that the most likely source was the polymeric uh, toner particles, which you see SEM images of both the powder and its melted form in the form of a printed word on a piece of paper. So um, the first um, more detailed example I wanted to discuss was identification of flame retardants in environmental dusts. And uh, for this study, our partners uh, were looking at monitoring um, flame retardants in um, California as part of a childhood leukemia study. And what they were seeing is that specific indoor dust samples had anomalous variability in uh, BDE compounds, specifically BDE-209. Um, what we were doing then to help them was to look at the dust samples, particularly the high variability dust samples uh, with SEM. Um, and also with ramen. Uh, what we found was a lot of microplastics. Uh, it was probably one of our earliest uh, microplastics um, studies, though it wasn't, uh, we didn't know that when we started. Um, these were synthetic fragments, coatings, uh, and fibers on the order of 10 to 100 micrometers. And we saw once we looked at them in the SCM that they had discrete um, flame retardant inclusions um, on the order of much smaller particles, 0.1 to 1 microns. And we also saw in environmental dust particles, like you see on this slide, that in some cases they had broken up into much finer particles, um, theoretically as small as the smallest inclusions, um, which are some micron. Um, so that is somewhat a cause for alarm. Uh, but what we were able to determine with the, for our partners was that the most variable samples were the ones that had very high concentration individual flame retardant particles, not very many of them. So for say a whole dust average sample on the order of 10 parts per million flame retardants, you would actually have just a few particles with orders of magnitude higher concentrations in the individual particles, up to 30% bromine in some cases. And that we felt um, could explain the variability that they were seeing. It also implies that the um, potential flame retardant exposures to occupants of these houses would also expect to see heterogeneous exposures, depending on whether they encountered some of these high concentration uh, particles. So that type of spatial information was really uh, useful. Um, we saw a number of different morphologies of particles, and as part of that observation, we decided to look at consumer products to see if we can get some more information about their likely sources based on the spatial distribution of flame retardants in these particles. So um, we also started to realize that manufactured products had a very unique morphology in the SEM, which became useful for later studies. Um, this type of uniform distribution of submicron uh, inorganic um, additives are pretty typical of manufactured polymers and manufactured products in general. And you see lots of examples of that on the right. Here's some examples of consumer products. Um, it turned out that the upholstery and textile coatings um, mat were a good match to a lot of the environmental particles we saw. And that kind of makes sense because these are very friable coatings. Um, that you might expect to wear down in the environment over time and distribute their solid phase, um, primarily deca BDE in our samples, um, flame retardants. So on the left, you see some examples of these fibers, 
with the black coating, um, each of those black um, polymeric um, coating particles had within them submicron and micron sized bromine and antimony particles. Um, in some cases, we would see multiple types, such as in the bottom, you see a foam particle. In the SCM, its most distinctive property is its gross morphology rather than the um, flame retardant, but it has this very distinctive um, foam morphology. Um, you can also see in the left image the black particles, which were the um, which were the decabede based flame retardant. However, the foam was also diffused throughout with another type of uh, brominated compound. Um, also in this project, we looked at uh, various electronics enclosures that had a slightly different morphology. And uh, with that, I will move on to a different type of consumer product in which we found microplastics. This would be vaping devices. Again, um, in this study, the we didn't start out looking for them. Um, the focus of the study was actually to look at possible causes, um, as many of you might be aware of recent uh, vaping associated lung injury outbreaks. Um, there was the hypothesis that we were working from that vitamin E acetate, which was found in most of the newer vaping devices um, possessed by patients, um, could be catalyzed uh, in the presence of metals, ceramics, and high temperatures into toxic compounds like ethanol. And that was one hypothesis for injury. So we started taking apart um, patient vaping devices, comparing them to other devices um, to see if we could find these um, internal parts. And we did. We found, as you see on the lower left, um, some evidence of charring and high temperatures inside these devices, as well as an uh, different internal geometry than previous vaping devices. We also found metals and ceramics inside. So all that is consistent um, with the hypothesized injury mechanism. What we also found was polymer parts inside um, in, in a great many of the devices, new and old, which I didn't expect to see. Um, that is became then another uh, area of interest in this study um, because those polymer parts are exposed to high temperatures as well, potentially. And the image on the lower right, you kind of see a schematic of the different part configurations we found in the study. And the blue regions are all the polymer based uh, components. And those range up to four millimeters, but down to um, 10 microns in some cases. And um, those are the smallest ones would be um, well, I'll show you that in the next slide. Um, so this is an example of um, an inventory of the different components in just one of the more modern THC uh, delivery devices um, in which we found plastics, ceramics, fibers, and heavy metals. So the battery contact and filaments um, were nickel based with some chromium. Um, and with SEM, we could get nice spatial resolution, sometimes even seeing different chemical um, compositions at different parts of the filament and wire leads, um, as well as fiberglass, ceramics, and on the bottom, uh, you see these on um, this morphology typical of a semi-synthetic polymer fiber, uh, such as rayon, that was used to wrap around the heating element. In the upper image, there's also an example of the um, kind of rubbery polymer gaskets that we found in a lot of these devices. Here's uh, another type of polymer based um, item that wasn't in the previous cartridge, but was in several others. Um, it's this clear sort of uh, plastic sheath, um, about half a millimeter by one and a half millimeters. Um, we found high concentrations of fluorine by SEM EDS in this polymer, um, which let us believe is a, you know, a fluorinated polymer, but with FTR, we were able to confirm that it was uh, PTFE. Um, it depends, uh, really depends on what exactly how the high the temperatures are getting in these devices, but there have been many um, studies that have documented the hazards of uh, heated PTFE um, 
especially in, in industrial scenarios. But in this case, if temperatures get up to 300 degrees Celsius, um, most of the studies have shown that um, you're in danger of liberating some type of fluorinated gases. But that is a big question mark. It is possible that these devices stay below 300 degrees Celsius, and we're currently looking at that issue. Um, here is another um, example of polymers. Um, these are um, rubbery gaskets of various different types you see in different devices around the battery contacts or to seal uh, the end cap or around the um, heating element itself, which is what you see on the right. Um, we did FTIR on that. In, in almost every case, we saw um, basically just a silica peak, uh, silicon peak in addition to the carbon and oxygen. Um, and FTIR confirmed uh, that uh, that is likely due to silica additives as well as um, calcium carbonate additives in some cases and a polymer ID of um, styrene butadiene rubber. Um, again, the any danger of liberating styrene um, would be dependent on exactly how hot it gets inside these devices. So that's the big question mark right now. Um, and then finally, I wanted to talk a bit more about um, looking at microplastic debris in water and fish. So um, as many of you know who have worked in this field, um, the biomass associated with environmental samples um, of microplastic, containing microplastic degree um, is really <clears throat> the subject of uh, a lot of different approaches to try and remove this biomass so you can identify the microplastics. In a lot of cases, dissolving the whole samples with chemicals is a good way to do that. In our projects, we have looked at alternatives to dissolving the whole samples. Um, for one, on the upper right, you see some image of SEM, uh, FTIR, and we also took uh, Raman data from the study that showed that we were getting some surface contamination through the whole sample dissolution process. Um, in this case, potassium salts, which you see in the upper right. Um, we wanted to avoid that, and there's there's been plenty of uh, publications that have shown ways of avoiding that. Um, but in our case, it's also desirable to avoid dissolving the whole sample because we are interested in looking at intact prey and other environmental conditions of the samples um, before destroying them. So uh, we tend to do a pretty thorough uh, inspection uh, under the optical microscope and various techniques of the sample and it, with as little um, distress to the sample as possible. Um, and then after we've done that, um, we use a mechanical technique, pulsed ultrasonic extraction to um, separate the biomass from the microplastics. Um, for samples in which we wish to refrain from chemicals completely, we can then just um, deposit the samples on either a filter or collect in a petri dish, depending on the particle size and the amount of biomass. We also just published a paper where we did do chemical treatment of the final particles, um, and we feel that that's a good compromise between getting very clean particles, but also um, being able to look at the sample um, pre-chemicals before you get to that point. So this is a look at what some of these particles look like with a non-chemical approach. Um, you see there are some attached um, biomass structures and mineralized structures, but not enough to prevent the analysis of the polymers. Um, so in some cases, we feel, again, that that is an advantage. Um, for example, uh, you can see in the upper right, there's sort of a complicated network of mineralized structures on that polystyrene particle, which suggests that particle has been in the environment for a long time. Um, also, another example is uh, on the lower right, you see a fairly large polyethylene uh, plastic fiber, which um, since we didn't destroy the stomach, we could see was actually stuck in the opening of the stomach. And due to you know, the nature of fibers being having very long aspect ratio, 
it was able to get in, uh, but apparently not get out. Um, and it, the stomach actually was one of the only ones we found that was completely empty of other material. Could be a coincidence, or perhaps it did block the stomach of this fish. Um, so that was interesting information to find in the sample. Um, and it also calls to issue the decision of whether this should be called a microplastic. Um, by its smallest dimension, it is by most definitions, but by its longest uh, dimension, it is not. But I think this is a useful example of um, why it, it actually could be considered a microplastic. Um, because it clearly entered the organism based on its smallest dimension. Um, I wanted to mention a few other preparation techniques that we use. Um, I should have mentioned in the previous slide, all those were um, contact mode, FTIR, uh, ATR mode, which we still prefer for the biggest microplastic particles, but for smaller ones, um, we have a couple different techniques for doing microtransmission or reflectance which in our case is essentially double transmission since you're passing it through uh, the particle hitting reflective surface and passing it through the particle again. So on the left, you see a prep method in which uh, we take the um, typical SEM stub with adhesive carbon tab, which we use for uh, a lot of our analyses. But in this case, we have an inexpensive aluminum foil uh, square mounted on it. Um, which we have found suitable for um, getting decent signal to noise uh, back to the FDR detector. Um, but uh, by mounting particles and especially fibers along the edges of the foil, we can secure the particle in place, but also have a portion of it over the reflective surface. And this is enabled slightly higher throughput uh, as compared to ATR and lower size limit down to about 10 microns, especially for fibers. Um, I, there are examples in the bottom of using spectral math and spectral imaging maps to help identify these uh, microplastics. In the middle, um, you see an example of um, various library spectra to um, uh, add together and account for all the observed peaks in the unknown, in this case being uh, polyethylene and uh, several uh, butyl phthalates, uh, plastic additives. Uh, the Raman also found uh, pigment uh, uh, constituents. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see our, the method we use for analyzing directly in a filter and doing microtransmission. Um, this has really uh, been useful to us, particularly for the cleanest samples. Um, in this case, a, dr a simulated drinking water sample uh, round robin that we participated in. Um, on the lower right, you see two different spectral imaging maps, specifically uh, correlation maps uh, that we're generating using our reference microplastics. So they both correspond to the same red box um, in the, um, the mosaic reflected light image above it. It's just that the lower left one highlights the only the PVC particles that were present in that image in the lower right hand uh, correlation map only shows the PET particles. Uh, for my last couple of slides, I wanted to show um, some of the utility for uh, SEM for microplastics, although uh, the EDS component is uh, pretty much mostly useful for identifying chemically the chlorine, chlorine rich polymers such as PVC. But morphology wise, there's a lot of interesting things uh, you can determine with SEM. For one, that kind of characteristic manufactured uh, material uh, property that I mentioned earlier with the uniformly distributed inorganic uh, plastic additives. Um, in the two examples on the left, um, those didn't turn out to be flame retardants, but rather um, other common additives such as titanium dioxide or calcium carbonate, common plastic fillers. Um, this then becomes a very useful screening technique uh, because one can very quickly uh, scan a sample, hundreds, thousands of particles um, to find potential candidate microplastics that then can be identified with other microspectroscopy techniques such as FTIR or Raman. Also on the right-hand 
uh, side of the screen, you see example of the kind of weathering you can see at with using a higher spatial resolution technique like SEM. Uh, for older microplastics that have degraded in the environment, you see these characteristic cracks and um, fraying of fibers like you see in these two images. Uh, and then sort of as a the complement to screening for microplastics, you, SEM is very useful for screening out uh, false positives. Uh, very quickly, not only with the X-ray detector, um, which can identify inorganic false positives, but also uh, with the backscatter detector in an SEM, uh, you can very quickly separate the dark particles, um, which are either biological or polymeric, or versus the bright particles, which are inorganic. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware of the false positive potential of um, mineral-based uh, particles, such as shells, calcium uh, oxides, aragonite, uh, like you see in the middle. Um, what is perhaps less commonly discussed are other false positives, such as natural polyamides, um, i.e. proteins, uh, which you see on the left, um, various um, types of biological fibers, films, and even spheres, which resemble um, perhaps on first glance microbeads, um, but turn out to be uh, protein-based. Um, also with the, the fibers and the films uh, that you see in A and B on the left, um, you see a strong uh, regions of calcium mineralized tissues, uh, which are a clue to their biological origin. And then finally on the right, um, you see fibers, which uh, under the SCM are clearly uh, not microplastic fibers, but rather um, zooplankton, radiolaria, um, often silicon based, but in some cases, such as the ones you're seeing here, um, belong to organisms which uh, concentrate um, strontium and sulfur into these uh, strontium sulfate structures. Um, with that, I'll leave you with one more picture of a silica based um, zooplankton structure, um, false positive. Um, and I'd like to thank in a special um, my co authors on most of these works, Song Min Wang and Shitopa Goso as well as uh, a variety of other uh, energetic and enthusiastic collaborators we've had um, from various organizations on these projects. Um, and I'll leave you with some references for this work and uh, thank you for inviting me.